Now, who knows what that is? What is it? What is it? About what? Coke. About Coke. <laughs> so does, does anybody have <laughs> anybody have an idea when that commercial last aired on TV? 71, actually. But that's the best guess I've heard ever. And, and so. So it's been 40 years since that commercial aired on TV. And almost everybody in this room recognized it. That right there is the power of music. Now, I'm going to talk about music, if you hadn't guessed. I'm not going to talk about music theory or music history or music class. But what I am going to talk about is changing our approach to education. I'm going to tell you about some really cool concepts. I'm going to show you how music is a really powerful tool that we should be using effectively in education. Now, for the purposes of this speech, I'm not talking about music as your favorite song, or even that it has to be a song. I'm just going to call music structured sound. Uh, and music is powerful. Music impacts our brain. Now, this is kind of crazy to think about, but when I hear a pitch, I hear its own la, it plays in my head. And those frequencies, exactly how they played out here, they resonate in my brain. Now, not only do they resonate in my brain, my brain resonates with them. So the, the m brain signals mimic, they, they match whatever is coming in in sound. So our brains are entrained and stabilized when we listen to music. Now, this phenomena is, is a direct physical phenomena. It's the kind of thing that we can ignore it, but it's a fact. It's not like our eyes where I take in, I see this video camera at the back of the room, and I, I can recognize these shapes, and it's the color black. And my mind does all this conjuring to figure out that's a video camera. It is a direct physical relation. Now, if our brain syncs up with a pitch when we hear it, imagine if a classroom was in sync with the teacher in the same way. Music is something that can set the mood. We've all heard that music soothes the savage beast. Well, what we don't all know is that the music in restaurants is chosen specifically to get you to eat quickly and get out so that they can turn the table and make more money. There's been studies that have done, been done to prove this. And so restaurants take advantage of this technology called music. The movies are really good at using music to set the stage. Now, how do you know when the hero's on the stage or the villain is on the stage? Da, 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 da. Yeah, so I want you to take a moment, close your eyes, and let's visualize, feel the emotions that you feel when you hear these themes. <laughs> tension there, <laughs> you're like, your heart starts getting, uh, you know, you're, so I was feeling a little scared myself. So go ahead, let's try this again. We'll feel something a little bit different. So what did you feel? You felt stormtroopers. <laughs> it feels triumphant. You feel excited. You, you feel like something's about to happen that's a, a positive thing or, or something that's not quite so positive for somebody. 
Well, it's positive for that guy. That's true. So we'll try one more. Get something totally different. So it conjured a totally different feeling. What did you feel when you heard that? Quiet. Tragic. Everybody did get quiet. There was a little laughing. I think you had to let out the nervous tension from the previous two. But everything did get quiet. We felt serene. We felt a little sad. So this is the power that's being used by the movie industry or by media all around us to control our emotions. So beyond that, music affects our body, not just our emotions. There have been studies shown that when we listen to fast music, our heart rate increases. If it's faster than our heart rate, if it's slower than our heart rate, our heart slows down. This isn't news. We all know it intuitively. If you go exercise, you don't listen to you know, the Blue Danube. You listen to something that's fast and rocking and gets you going. There was actually a study at Brunel in, uh, University in England that showed that people who exercise in synchronization with music have an increase in endurance of 15%. It decreases their fatigue by 10%. And, and the one that was startling for me is it decreases their body's need for oxygen by 7%. Now, if that's not compelling, I don't know what is. Now, another way that music impacts our body, that we use it in our society, is through meditation. You know, when you meditate, your heart rate becomes more stable, your breathing slows down, and it goes further than just listening to this slow music. Now, you remember we talked about that direct connection with our brain and music, and how our brain entrains itself to music. Our brain synchronizes with the music. Now, we can leverage that a step further with a technology called binaural beats, which can be used to in induce mental states. And I'll explain binaural beats to you a little more in detail in a minute. But these mental states are actually the states that our brain is in. Delta is the first one, which is 1 to 4 hertz. And delta is the, the state when we're asleep. So if, if you're hearing something that resonates at 1 to 4 hertz, it will put you in a delta state. This is you know, oversimplification right now, but delta is asleep. The next step above that is theta, which is that twilight condition, the meditative condition, the highly creative and unrestrained by reality dream state where you're half awake and half asleep. We can create that. Alpha is where we're at most of the time when we're not stressed out. Alpha is where we want to be most of the time. But sometimes we're in beta. And in Western society, a lot of times we're in beta, which is 14 to 30 hertz. And it's when we're stressed out. It's that fight or flight response. And we spend a, way too much time in our society in this, in this mind state. And it's a state where we don't think clearly. It's not a state where we can be creative. So we want to use this technology to put us in these lower states of alpha and theta where we can think clearly, we can think creatively. And are you guys ready for a challenge? Are we? Yes. yes? Are we ready for a challenge? Yes. All right. So I'm going to talk about some stuff that's a little bit geeky now. And it may make your brain hurt just a little bit. Um, if we listen to music, and it affects our, our mindset like this, it can do that in the background, not just in the foreground. So this is stuff that's going on in the background. You've got tones or music playing in the background. And it's affecting your mindset, your mental state. When you, so when you play two tones together, a third tone is created. That's called a tartini tone or an undertone. And basically, uh, go on to the next slide. 
uh, what happens is you've got these two frequencies playing, and when they're in sync with each other, it goes up, and when they're out of sync, it disappears. And that creates that undertone. So if that undertone is a tone that's in that, that 1 to 4 hertz or in that 4 to 8 hertz or 8 to 14, you induce those mind states going along. Now, what's even cooler than that, that's just the physics of it, is the neurology of it. Because if I play one pitch in one ear and I play the other pitch in the other ear, your brain makes that up. It creates that same phenomenon without those tones ever being in physical contact with each other. You know, which I've used this technology myself, and I can personally vouch that it works for me. I can't claim that it works for you, but you know, it is amazing because when you do this, you're actually creating a connection between the right and left hemispheres of your brain. And we talk about that that the left and right brain connection is really important for problem solving and creative thinking. Um, but we've got to have both sides of our brain working simultaneously to do this. And music with binaural beats actually facilitates that communication between the right and left hemispheres of the brain. Uh, we should be using and leveraging this technology that we have in music to elevate our level of education and increase our abilities, you know, ourselves and throughout the school systems. Because with this technology, we can actually create a, a set of a next generation to solve the next generation of challenges that we'll face. Now, we're going to play another little game. And this is the remembering game. Now, we, we did the Coke commercial at the beginning. But we're going to do just a series of a few more jingles, because we know that businesses use, use jingles really effectively to encode a message that we're going to remember because it's writing on the music. So I'm going to play a few jingles. As soon as you recognize it, I want you to shout it out. All right? All right? Yes. All right. <laughs> There we go, that was quick. All right. McDonald's. All right. Uh. There we go. Now, they don't even have to have words to be memorable. We can have jingles that are just notes, like. NBC or Intel, you got it. So are we harnessing this power to use music to make people remember things in our schools? I don't think so. So in addition, music has the power to make us smarter. Now I alluded to this a little earlier, but there have been a bunch of studies done in this this sphere, and most of them in the last 10 years or so. I'm going to only reference two, but you can do the research on your own. There's a lot more out there. Harvard did a, a research study recently that showed that in musicians, the corpus callosum, which is the structure that connects the right and left hemispheres of the brain, the information superhighway that allows for creative and divergent thinking, is bigger in musicians and more developed than in non-musicians. Now, if, if that's required for creative problem solving and musicians have more developed corpus callosum, it seems obvious that that should lead to musicians become more creative, better problem solvers. And a Vanderbilt study backed those physical findings with proof that musicians had higher IQs and increased capacity for creation and divergent thinking. Now, music also does one, well, among other things, music does another very important thing, which is it, it creates unity and community in our society and can be done in the classroom as well. So I want you to all stand up right now. Close your eyes. Now imagine you're standing on a podium. 
There are thousands of people around you, and they're all screaming. You just won an Olympic gold. <laughs> Now what did you feel? That's good enough. <laughs> so now how can we apply this technology? Well the first one's pretty obvious. We can apply it to set the classroom mood. Now we have this idea in our schools that you know we have a blank slate to work on these kids and you know, sit down, shut up, and listen to me. <laughs> but we don't have a blank, blank slate. These kids are listening to media on their iPhones, on their iPods, two and a half hours every day. And most of those messages are not positive messages. They're listening to songs about drug, drugs and sex and getting drunk. And they're not, these are not messages that are pointing them in a direction that's necessarily positive for their lives. So maybe we could do something in our schools to set the mood and counteract these messages so that we have students who are calm and receptive. And then we end up with classrooms that are maybe a little easier to manage. Now, music also has the power to help us remember. Uh, um, when we're kids, how do we learn the ABCs? So if you were to recite the ABCs for me right, right now, you wouldn't say A, B, C. You'd sing A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So why do we quit doing that when they get six? You know, it's fine up till five. And now, now you know, you're going to have to do mathematics in a serious way. You know, why aren't we using this later? Now, H Hannah Montana had a really cool episode now, Hannah was trying to memorize the bones of the body, and the teacher, she was having trouble. So she put a song to it. And the teacher wasn't so hip on the idea until she realized that it worked. Everybody knows the bones just had to find a way. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. That's how I'll get an A. Stuart, I thought I told just you. Give her a chance, please. <laughs> My body's many parts, and this is where it starts. Phalanges, I have ten, and metatarsals then. I got some tarsals too. I'll put them in my shoe. She's telling the truth. <laughs> the fibula is next, according to my text. Then comes the tibia. That ain't no fibia. And now I'm up to my knee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the patella to me. So we can actually use this technique in all sorts of areas of schooling. For instance, in social studies, we can study the music of an era and how the music interacts with what was going on in the society. In science, there's great connections with psychology, neurology, physics, even quantum physics is intimately related to music. In math, you've got counting, you've got fractions. In India, they're actually using rhythms to teach kids math. And why do you think India's kicking our butt in math? <laughs> you know, it, and, and in English, the connection between poetry and song 
What, what's more integral than that? So this brings us to super learning. Boom, boom, boom. So super learning is a technique that uses music and relaxation techniques to help increase the speed of learning something and improve your recall. Now, I've also got info on this that you can email me and I'll send you. But their research found that you can increase recall and speed of learning by up to three times. I'm not claiming that. This was in the book. Now, they recommended Baroque music, which would fit this kind of style of music. I used this technique when I was in high school. I went to bed every night for quite a while listening to super learning music. And I can, I can attest that it really helps clear your head and relax your body and put you in a really restful state and clear thinking. But I dug deeper into this technology and I realized that it's not just the style of music. It's not just Baroque music with Largo movements that have a, a rhythm, you know, a, a pulse of 60 to 80 hertz, or 60 to 80 beats per minute. Uh, it's an attribute of the music that's important. And I found that the chant in Greg, Gregorian chant, and also the meditation chants in Indian, and Hindu, Indian Hindu and Chinese Buddhist meditations fall into these same attributes of creating these, these undertones and frequencies that create theta and alpha states and sometimes even delta states in your brain. This is not magic. This is science. A and these older cultures knew it intuitively. They just didn't have the language to describe it that we have today scientifically. So when can we use this super learning? Well, we could easily use it at the beginning of the day or the beginning of the class period. We could use it when kids are studying. We could use it during test times when people are already in those beta mind states to bring them down, to set the mood. Now, what are the possibilities if we have a student body that's receptive and open to learning, that's able to think creatively and, and is, you know, is in that calm state? I mean, just imagine what would happen you know, if we've got 100 million students in the schools and we could increase the efficiency using music by, let's go really conservatively, 10%, 15%. How, how huge of an impact would that have on our society? You know, what could we create with that, that minimal improvement? So what can we do? Should, should music be an elective? Or should music be considered a technology to bring, up, bring about receptive creativity, to increase memory, to make it easier to learn? We know that the outside messages that our, our children and us are bombarded with every day, 5,000 ad messages and all these negative messages come through the media. You know, talk about the news. You know, if we can, if we can combat those negative messages that are hitting us all the time, what can we change? We, we should not put music in a box under the bed. You know, that's not the right answer. So I can't do this alone. You know, this is a big, big situation that we need. It's a big challenge that we're facing. And I can't do it alone. So are you guys in to help me to join in? So if you email me, I'm working to create a community of people who want to change this situation, want to improve things. Drop me an email. That's my contact info. Thank you very much.